Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for attending our very last research lecture series. Um, we are so pleased that you're here despite the heat and the busy time of year. And I'd like to introduce our Ross here faculty member who holds a joint appointment, um, Dr. Ron Avi Astor. He's um, not only is he an expert in school violence and bullying across cultures, but he's multi interdisciplinary. Um, he's the Richard M. and Ann L. Thor Professor in Urban Social Development um, at USC School of Social Work. And he is also, as I said, a professor here at Ross Hear School of Education. And he is the, the person who brought our distinguished speaker to visit us today. And I'd like him to give the introduction since he knows her work best. Thank you. I always listen to that and go, that, who's that? Uh, uh, <laughs> I always thought out of body, I still have to grow into these titles and these words, but they work with policymakers and other people. So, uh, I, I just wanted to start out uh, as we have been with all our collaborations to remind everybody here that research is not just about research, research is mainly about relationships. Uh, it's about knowing people, feeling comfortable with other people, liking other people, respecting other people's work. And good ideas only come out of that. They don't come out of theory only. They don't come out of research. And I think this is a great example you know, for the Rossier School of really a lot of cool, interesting, theoretical, empirical stuff. I want to start out with how wonderful our, our, our partners are and how we enjoy being with them uh, as human beings, because that's <laughs> the most important part. Uh, the second part is that their uh, deep interest and thirst for knowledge and to do good in the world at the same time. So you have a wonderful triage uh, trinity, not the Catholic trinity, sorry, uh, but uh, 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 you know, good ideas, wanting to do good in the world, and just really wonderful theoretical and empirical rigor in their thought. And so I want to start off with uh, both introducing both Veronica and Marianne, who are, is also our partner here, and uh, Veronica's husband, Jose, who without all this, nothing happens here, as with all our spouses, and he's actually here in the back, and a well-known photographer in his own right, so you can talk to him later, so thank you all for being here. But I want to just give a little bit of a sense of how the project is situated. Uh, in essence, some of you know of the DODIA project that we have with Military Connected Kids because we plaster that in emails all over the place and you've seen our faces and our projects and whatever. And we also have the Israel project that's been going on for a long time around issues of monitoring. And so I'd like you to start thinking of the idea that we not only, for those of you who went to ARA, measure at the country level or at the county level or at the district level, but you actually have that same kind of decision-making information seen as the voice of the students, teachers, and parents coming from the local sites as well. So that data is interactive, could speak to each other, and then you can apply that to many kinds of issues around academics, around social issues. And this project in, in Chile came out of friendship and collaborations, and the idea that somehow uh, this could be applied to another yet cultural context that's a little bit different, and that's kind of what we're so excited about, is because it's similar and it's a sister project to these other two projects, but it also brings a whole array of different questions and issues that transact and go both ways. So I want to thank Rossier for actually, for those of you who actually went and visited uh, and, and actually spoke, but also the research team, Rami Benbenishti here, who's my partner in crime, uh, to all these things for actually bringing the Israel part into this, and we have the California part, and I'd also like to acknowledge the whole building capacity team that's here, there's too many of you, to, uh, to, to for, for actually doing the mirror images of this in San Diego as well, too. When that short introduction, and mind you, that is a short introduction, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, invite Veronica to come and speak. Good morning, everybody. My name is Veronica. I'm here with Maria. We're both from the School of Psychology at uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica del Paraíso, that's my name, <laughs> in Chile. Um, these, uh, oops, oops, wait. Is there a pointer? Oh, I don't know. Is there a pointer on there? It doesn't the local thing. Oh, it's weak. We can do without. I, 
I just wanted to uh, see how the logos are there. The one on the left is uh, from the government of uh, Chile. It's the uh, National Commission of Science and Technology who's been funding our uh, projects progressively. And the other one is our School of Psychology. Next to it is uh, our university. And the logo to the right is from the Corporación Municipal de Valparaíso, which is uh, similar to your district level um, local administrators of public schools in Valparaíso. So this is a joint collaboration between research and uh, the government and the local, the local governments. What I'll be talking to you about today is that this, uh, the, a project which in, in which we're collaborating with the uh, University of Southern California and with Barilan University through Ron and Rami, our, our friends and our research uh, partners and co-researchers in this, in this project. Let me see how this The purpose of uh, this uh, project is uh, it's really to help uh, improve the quality of uh, life that students have in Chile, especially in public schools. Um, this is really like the, the rationale, the, the underlying purpose. Now there is of course a, a research purpose um, attached to it, uh, but I, I want to say that I think what we've connected uh, a lot with Ron is not just the idea of doing academic research for academic purposes and for tenures, but also to uh, really uh, help um, insofar as we know that uh, we can. So what we're doing is um, I'd like to show you and go through some, uh, a bit about the state of the art in terms of the political uh, the policy uh, making in Chile, also in terms of uh, the literature that we, we take from. And then I'll show you some of our research findings and that um, fundament and, and make the argument for this uh, R&D project that we're in, doing now for these uh, two years. And um, then I'll talk to you about the project. So in terms of the policy making, what we have in Chile is a, is a big paradox because uh, in a sense somewhat similar to the No Child Left Behind Act that you have in the U.S., what we have is a law uh, of uh, preferential subsidies. Chile is, uh, um, is financed by voucher system, but the voucher is not given to the families, it's given to the schools per enrollment and assistance. That's how the system works. We have three types of schools, public municipal schools, private subsidized schools, which is sort of like what your charter schools are, not, are here, and private private schools. So it's a, it's a complex, but it's basically um, the Ministry of Education does the curriculum. And also have, we have a national assessment system, a test, uh, which is an academic test. And, um, but the, 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 the schools are financed the two types of schools are financed by the state, by the national government. However, in the public schools, the, the administration is given to the district levels, and in the private schools, any private party can uh, administer the school. That's the main difference. In the private schools, a private, a private party administers, but there is no finance from the public government. That's the main difference. So what we have is a highly stratified uh, educational system as uh, reported by the OECD in 2004 and again in 2011 uh, where basically poor students study in public in our public schools. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, on top of that national policies and regulations especially since the year 2001 we have a law on school violence, we have the subsidy law which is similar to the No Child Left Behind that makes schools responsible for uh, not only academic achievement, but also for um, obtaining high educational quality, also in terms of uh, school living together, which is what we call uh, convivencia escolar, is the term in Spanish. There's no direct translation, but it's sort of like um, school climate issues. The paradox are that schools are obliged to improve because, um, because there's consequences. Consequences are that they can be fined, that they have to pay money, or they can um, be reduced funding, or they can even be shut down, uh, the schools in Chile. If they don't comply with a lot of regulations, which were up to the year 2011, basically language and math um, proficiency, and now they're also school living together issues. And the paradox is that schools have, are obliged to improve, but they don't know how, because they don't have enough uh, information. There is no um, evaluation system in Chile. 
So what we did is uh, to design, to implement, and to validate, that's our proposal, a system for monitoring school living together, which may allow informed decisions at the school level that may enable a decrease in school violence and an improvement in school climate. So we're focusing on um, civic participation within the school, uh, within the schools, but uh, also school management issues. We believe, and our research findings have shown that um, school management is really important for school climate. And, and all of the school effectiveness literature and all of the school leadership literature is relevant for improving school climate. Because um, it's not about only just you know nice words. You really have to change practices, change uh, school practices. So we take from a socio-ecological perspective. That's where we're working uh, on that perspective. In in this kind of sense, this is how our, uh, how we did, adapted it. And this is what we show schools and what we show um, and we show ourselves. Uh, we think that. Um, uh, a socio-ecological perspective can be understood in, in, net, in terms of uh, nested uh, microsystems, which build into the microsystems, uh, where peer relations are related, um, uh, put it the other way around. Peer victimization and bullying and those kinds of issues are not only issues of individuals. Um, so the interventions are not, not, should not only be uh, directed at the individual level. Why? Because uh, peer victimization, which is at the peer relations level, is connected to teacher-student relationships, which in turn is connected to school climate issues, which in terms is connected to cultural issues. So this is where we uh, really connect with uh, Ron's and, and Rami's thinking in terms of the, the cultural issues involved in school violence, but also the connectedness between the different levels. And this was really important because it guided, it's been guiding our uh, research for the past years. Now, um, some of the pre previous research findings that we, uh, I want to show you, and this is from a, res a research grant funded by the National Commission of Science and Technology, in which we, um, we invited Ron and Rami to Chile, they came last year, and so we're, they're helping us analyze uh, the data gathered from that. It's a mixed method studies, and um, we're studying the relationship between peer victimization, classroom climate, school climate, school well-being. But one of the, some of the research findings I'd like to share with you is uh, one, on one side that students from our lower in social economic income, that is the students enrolled in public schools, do report higher levels of peer victimization and teacher victimization and do also report lower levels of class or worse levels of classroom climate and school well-being. And that the highest predictor of peer victimization, that is, uh, a student reporting having, victim, having been victimized by another student is that same student having reported being victimized by uh, a teacher. So there are, you know, similar uh, associations between peer victimization and teacher victimization. And um, so uh, that's the, the graph to show the first finding. Uh, the, the blue is the municipal. Not only that you can see that they're higher, uh, both on peer verbal as well as peer physical perpetration and victimization. Um, the frequency of teacher victimization, as we're studying it, there's not many much literature uh, around on this issue, but 28% um, uh, of the children said that another, some teacher had either scolded at them or yelled at them during the last week, and four uh, to five percent had said that uh, they, sh they report physical victimization. In terms of uh, the prediction, what we, from this nested model, we entered on a hierarchical uh, regression stepwise. The, um, the, um, the variables that we thought would be predicted in the, in the order from the nested models. And what you can see here is that the, the red, the teacher victimization, verbal teacher victimization, is the highest predictor of uh, students verbal victimization, and this was also the case for physical victimization. So the uh, percentage of variance is 17.4, and the model adjusts when you enter the other variables, such as teacher uh, physical victimization, classroom climate, school climate. We used Ron's and uh, Rami's school climate scale, and school well-being, but you get, um, so the, the numbers kind of adjust. The models uh, is significant uh, with the other variables, so they do add 
uh, uh, their own their own unique contribution, but it's really teachers' victimization that uh, really explains most of the variables, at least with the with the variables that we we used, that really explains uh, peer victimization. So our first conclusion is in terms of the malice that we're seeing in public schools is that students from, from these public schools not only obtain lower scores on standardized testing, which is something we're not, you know, it's not part of a research project, but it's, uh, it's gathered knowledge that this is so. They also score lower on measures of school violence and school well-being. So um, we did this with our own research instruments, which we adapted from existing, we validated for our country, etc. And this, for us, uh, this really speaks of the inequity of education, not only in terms of academic achievement, but also in terms of social-emotional opportunities to learn, or learning uh, of social-emotional civic participation skills. So uh, for us, in terms of policy making, this is an argument to say that we need to start thinking of, the quali of measuring the quality of, of education in other terms. And this is where we connect with the national government, who, as I've been um, telling Ron and Rami this uh, last few weeks, are really changing things in Chile. So the Ministry of Education is now in charge of the curriculum, but they built up another uh, sort of like the Rama in Israel, where uh, uh, a, a kind of department of uh, the Ministry of Education, but it's really in semi-independent from it, is going to be doing the national assessment system, which we have for about 20 years already. But they're going to add non-academic uh, dimensions to that national testing system. So it's not only going to be language and math and science, it's also going to be school climate and um, other issues as well. So uh, what we're doing here, we hope uh, that can um, feed into uh, what the government is planning to do. Uh, this is another research finding which was uh, published in that book. It's about uh, good school practices, some case studies, qualitative case studies, and in two schools, uh, um, you were in one school, mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, no? Yes. Elizabeth, she visited Chile well, last year with the uh, uh, browsers. Uh, 13 uh, EDD students mm -hmm. in the school. Mm -hmm. And we took her to one of these uh, schools, so, so you know this school. Mm -hmm. And what we did is to, um, uh, to find schools with uh, what we as researchers believe to have, so it's an informed uh, key, uh, what's it? Actor, key informant. Um, so, but the main the main findings from that, and we did uh, an inquiry based collective participat participatory um, methodology, was that um, what these two schools shared in some sense was on one part a shared vision of what it is that school living together is. So, because it's very different, you know, one school is very different from another school is very different from another school. But what they had in common is that they all shared somehow a same vision of what school living together was. So for one, for example, for a Catholic school, it could be really uh, being a missionary. And for a, a secular school, it could be being a civic, a democratic citizen, and or being a leader, and a social leader. We, we've done another study on that. Um, but that's, a, that's one common thing. Another thing is democratic and participatory management of, of convivencia escolar, escolar, which could be democratic in the sense of it's not only just the principal doing everything, it's him and the teachers, which is in a small sense is semi-democratic, but it's very democratic for them uh, because you know in one school it could be we've had a history of very authoritative, so now the teachers are participating. In another school, it was really the students who were participating and they had the mediating um, um, methodologies where um, students act as, act as mediators for conflict resolution, and they, they were doing that. But in terms of uh, you know, a wider uh, look at it, it was, it was uh, sharing and democratic uh, school management. And together with that, a sense of autonomy in the management process. If you look at these findings, they really relate to the uh, findings on uh, school effectiveness processes. Another uh, study we've done uh, is using the PISA 2009 test because Chile, as, as USA, participates in the PISA um, studies. We looked at how uh, school climate um, affected the relationship between SES and academic achievement. Why? Because in Chile, 18% of the variance of, on the PISA 2009 test was explained by SES. So what we did 
um, was to, to, we did a sun model, a structural equation model, we did uh, regressions, and we did also multi-level, which, which we're still doing. And um, what we found is that school climate acts as a moderating and a mediating variable in the relation between SES and academic achievement, both in language as well as in math as well as in science, but it was, high, it was more on language. And uh, it was in also mixed method studies, and what we found was that schools who scored high, both in, so we looked for schools who scored high on PISA, uh, not all schools, uh, no, uh, they're not administered all schools, it's a uh, double stratified sample, so it was 200 schools in Chile. We looked at which schools scored the highest on the PISA test in Chile, but also scored the highest on our index of school climate. Why? Because we built an index of school climate using the PISA 2009 questionnaires. And so this climate, uh, this index measures satisfaction with schools, which uh, are some of the items from the student questionnaire, some of the items from the parent questionnaires, teacher support, autonomy, participation, and a non-negative view of students and families, which we say, um, when we say this, it's a, a positive view. It's really not a positive. It's, it's at least a non-negative view of uh, students and their families. That was published by the Ministry of Education last year. And um, the findings on that are that um, this is our index, a normalized index of uh, school climate, uh, measured as I told you, so we did a secondary data analysis on the PISA. And what we found is that um, the, this SEM model, uh, the, the, the indexes are not here, but they, they, they had a good fit, um, both in, ma in math as well as in language and science, which means that uh, in terms of the relationship between SES, which was here, I'm sorry, this is in Spanish, I didn't have time to do the translation. Um, this is annual household income, and that's school selectivity, meaning school selects students based on their academic records or based on their SES because they have to pay. Um, this is type of school, public, municipal, uh, private subsidized, private, private. And this is type of education, te te uh, technological professional or technical or uh, science and humanity. All of these have high, quality, uh, high associations with uh, math achievement, which means that uh, a student who goes to a public school, whose parents uh, are low income, whose uh, uh, schools don't select, and who uh, is uh, studying in a technical school, their chances of doing high in the PISA are very, very poor. Uh, and the, on the other way around, now a student who attends private schools, a private schools that select students academically, uh, where uh, the kind of education is science, humanitarian, and um, whose families have higher income, the coefficient is, is, is the, the association, the probabilities of that student achieving high is high. So it, it, this is just speaking of the uh, consequences of a highly stratified system in Chile. What we did is to uh, add school climate as a moderating the variable to see if perhaps uh, you know a kid who went to a public school whose parents were poor but the school has a good climate perhaps that moderates the effect and it does it does moderate the effect uh, it not only moderates the effect uh, I don't have a, it's not here uh, it also we can we can look at that tomorrow it also mediates the effect we used um, um, as indicator the pattern of interaction between SES and school climate, it turned out to be negative. So that also shows that uh, it turned out to be negative for public schools. So that, that, that means that the relationship, no, that means that the effect, the influence of school climate is much more important, is higher in public schools than, than in private schools. Perhaps because the variance of private schools is lower, but perhaps because it's just more important. It's, it's more important that teachers be caring and effective and, and have social support. It's more important for students to participate in, uh, in contexts where the social uh, capital is uh, you know, um, more at risk. So that's, uh, what, that's one research finding. And this is some uh, results, initial results from our um, multi-level analysis. This is the uh, uh, sex. This is an household income, ESES, which is another uh, index used by PISA. And this is the school, so this is the student's ESES. This, is, this measures uh, an household income. It also measures um, uh, number of uh, years that the parents, uh, educational level, parents' educational level. And it also measures uh, how many books do you have at home. 
So they built an index on that. So it's measured like social capital, social cultural capital, not also only SES. Um, this was the student ESES. This is the school's ESES. This is public, uh, public or not. This is kind of education, academic track, and the schools, uh, the school level index of school climate. And as you can see, um, the nice thing about the multi-level is that it can show you that you, the interpretation is a bit more easier. So you say that if the, if the mean on uh, the Chilean uh, national mean is way lower than the uh, whole international mean, which is uh, 500. Our mean is, yes, excuse me, 434 on, this was on, on math. But um, if you are, uh, for example. If your family is doing well, you get 31 uh, points more. Right, you get 39 points more. If your uh, school is uh, not public, then you get six points. If your school climate is positive, then you get 11 points more on the, on the PISA test. Tell me about the academic track. Academic track is a, was a question. So this is a, it's just a secondary data. Uh, they're not our instruments. Right. No? So right, right, we just right. use I what just was available. It, right. it was a question asked to the, the school principals. And the question was, uh, how important is it uh, for your school that uh, students be selected by their academic uh, or by their academic records, or that students be placed? Not academic tracking, it's, as you have in. Oh, okay, it's, that's what it's, it's, a, it's like uh, that students be academically selected. How important is it uh, for you that that students be um, uh, selected? Is that like is that an order? Time question. So oh, go yeah. ahead. Okay. So back to the monetary system. What we've proposed is that would be us, our research team in, in Pucve, which is Pontificia uh, Universidad Católica del Paraíso. This is you, the international researchers. Why in a square? Are we so square? Yeah. <laughs> Rosa says we're very square. <laughs> he hasn't hung out with me enough. <laughs> so I'm very obtuse. <laughs> We went to ARA, we have a saying, I don't know, it, it, it's Nyo Nyo, which is like very nerd. And we went, we went to the ARA Then you conference. should never go to SRCD. And he said, this is Nyo Nyo Land. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we thought we were cool. <laughs> okay, anyways. So, um, but don't you think Veronica fits right in? <laughs> Sorry, Jose, so you married Nyo Nyo. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're thinking is um, for us to provide in some ways, we don't know yet how. We're just, you know, this is a pilot study, two years. Um, but what we think is that we can provide um, for not only for schools, but also at the municipal level and, and also perhaps at the national level. So it's three different types of layers. Mm -hmm. Um, what can we provide? We can provide a system that may help schools by providing solid uh, information that's scientifically based and that may allow for comparative uh, studies. Comparative to for because Chile has no compare. Uh, we don't have any ways of comparing ourselves to any other countries on these issues. Mm -hmm. We do on academic achievement. We don't on the others. Um, and uh, also to help schools by supporting them. So it's, it's very important for us, our, our initial visit here, we're only going to be here two days, but I hope to uh, come back and for uh, other people from our research team also to come back, perhaps you to go to, to come to Chile as well, so that we can learn from each other. I think that's the main, um, the main point. What we are um, offering is a system of measuring, of evaluating school violence and school climate. We're working on, we've been working on the instruments with Ron and Rami, a system for reporting and for helping s schools interpret those reports, and then a system for, or a subsystem for uh, helping schools uh, improve by helping them improve their improve, improvement plans, which they already have to do because of the laws that I showed you before. So the schools are obliged to present a law which could mean that you know, they have to comply with the minimum, otherwise they get fined, otherwise you know, bad things can happen. 
Um, but the, the question that we raise is, well, how can you really improve if you have, how can we help you take this seriously? Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to take it seriously it's just by hunch, just by intuitions. Because if you don't have the relevant information, how can you really know where to go? You can go there, you can go there, but how can you really know? So um, our R&D, the, the R part of the project, is to see the outcomes in a two-year uh, period and to see if there are differences between three types of uh, support systems. Uh, one is based online, another is based on coaching. It's not online, it's face-to-face. -face. And the other one is between schools, so it's based on Bangor's community of practices. And um, we're working now on the design of that. The initial stages are engaging, engaging, engaging people. A lot of resistance from the school principals uh, uh, at first, a lot. Uh, better receptions with the people who really do the work on school living together inside the school. They're really enthusiastic about it. Um, what we do, we're doing is inviting schools to take part in the design and development. So we're working with, with, with three schools where we adapted the instruments that uh, Ron and Rami are using and we added to them, we evaluated, not, not just us, the research team, the schools, with the schools. Are these items enough? Are they pertinent? Are they sufficient? Are they uh, really don't make sense in the Chilean uh, school system? We've, we've added a, a few items as well. And what we're saying to the schools, well, this is the proposal. Year one, semester one, which is this year, this semester, we're evaluating. Year one, semester two, we're accompanying schools, and then we re-evaluate and see the results. We really don't expect to get much, very much results because we know it, it's, it's, a, it's a short time. But uh, the, the R&D project was two years, so you get what you, 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 you get what you can get. And we hope to uh, re-propose for another three-year period um, afterwards. And so we're really saying to the schools, this is the Cormoval, uh, the administrative, that with the schools and us, that we're really allies in this. In terms of the design, I won't go through that because just the specifics, perhaps an, um, uh, an innovation in terms of what uh, has already been done in California and in Israel is the going online part because our instruments are online. Why are they online? Because we evaluated the strengths and weaknesses and the cost uh, as well. And we thought, well, uh, our strength in Chile is that there is a high rate of technology in Chilean schools, in, in public schools as well. We're a very technological country. That's, uh, we have more cell phones than people. And um, <laughs> really, it's like double. And a lot of talking going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, but there are obviously some obstacles, like control. How do you get control of that, or, or can you lose control? But we evaluated that there are more some strengths in our uh, university. We hooked up with people we didn't know who were really experts, so you know, we made relationships with I think we're I think it's going to work. Um, so the solution is online administration for students and teachers who are more acquainted with technology, I mean, meaning computers, and paper administration for parents, but with a traditional administration procedure, which means we're not sending the questionnaires by email and have students answer them at home because they, they might not have a, a computer at home, but they do in their schools. And even if they did, they might not answer. So we take them to the uh, to the Math. computer room, have them sit down, and just do it as if it were a paper and pencil administration, but it's online. So what we do is we give them, and here's some examples. This is the, the it's a initial video, which was made also by the government of Chile on our research team. So they enter. That's the informed consent. This is what we're measuring, victimization by students, by staff, school climate, dangerous places in school and neighborhood, well-being and satisfaction. This is what we've uh, decided to, to measure. And this is um, what the questionnaire looks like. And this is the, the questions on school climate, peer victimization, teacher victimization, uh, dangerous places in school. Perhaps this is also like a, an advance of what uh, Ron and Rami has been doing, which is the maps that uh, uh, we ask the school staff to draw a map of the school. So this part is tailored to each school. We're asking them to draw a map, then we have a designer you know, redo the map, and have them uh, say, um, tell us, report, what are the, the numbers, what, what do they mean, in, in, in words that students can relate to. So uh, if a student sees this map, he's going to know, oh, this is my school. And the question is, Please identify the most dangerous place in your school. 
No, but this is the, we did the pilot study, and this is really you know ongoing collaboration. So just two years, two days ago, Rami said, well, perhaps you should ask three questions. So we're trying to see if we can adapt because we're going to start the, the administration now, and then we're going to ask what place would you like to improve in your school, plus what place uh, would you like to play to 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 improve the safety in your schools because. Uh, improving safety is not the same as just improving your school, your a place in your school all grow. Dangerous perceptions of neighborhoods, well-being and satisfaction with life, and then we get some um, information on their academic records. In terms of the design of the consultancy models, I won't go over that, but you know we're very interested in seeing how you're doing it in in, in, in California, how you how you do all of the support systems, because we believe that's a very important part. And I'd like to end with just a discussion at the national level. As I told you, we have a Ministry of Education who is now going just to uh, focus on the curriculum, the standards. We have standards, the national standards, on instruction. Uh, well, not on instruction, on achievement. But there's now uh, two different types of uh, structures and procedures. One is the agency, and another is the superintendency, which is not the same as your superintendents. The agency will be uh, responsible for evaluation and assessment of the quality. So we're talking to them in terms of how you're going to measure the quality of, of, of education, not only in terms of academic achievement, also in terms of school climate, for example. But, but what are you going to do with that information? Because what uh, last meeting we had with them, what, what they're going to do is to categorize schools. And after categorizing schools, they're going to help, or at least that's what they're saying, they're going to help the schools that are low, the lowest categories. But if they don't, the school can be shut down. So that's very similar to the no child left behind. Uh, someone's from AI say that policy environment, uh, a, a punitive policy environment. And the superintendency is responsible for making schools accountable, which means they, if the schools don't comply, then they go to the school and see, check all the regulations, do you have the norms, do you have this, and if they don't, they get fined, and they might even get uh, closed as well. Now, these people at the regional level, they asked us, and we signed an, uh, an MOU with them, they asked us to help us because they're the ones passing the fines, but they, they realized that they need more, that schools need more help, and not only having the protocols, because they have punitive protocols, they have protocols for expelling students, not for improving school climate. So how do you do about, how do you go about improving and um, implementing pedagogical and formative procedures? And not only expelling, you know, you, what are the, your actions? I take the, school, the, the student out of the classroom to the inspector, the inspector takes him out of the classroom to the psychologist, the psychologist takes him out of the school to the city level psychologist who takes him out, you know, it's just a procedure for the <laughs> yeah. students. So, for discussion, how do we avoid school rankings? How do we avoid punitive strategies? Can we avoid them in a context where a policy environment, a global uh, perspective could be that there is a, a, a global punitive policy environment in terms of policy making? Or, uh, so how, as researchers, what do we do? How, what do we do about it? Can we do something about it? Should we avoid it? What are the consequences of avoiding it? Should we go into it? What are, what are the consequences of getting, of getting it? And it's a very political issue uh, at the end. Or how to use, which is an, an reframing it in another way, or how, how can we use the data, how can we help schools use the data to inform decision making and to support the schools, which is another kind of policy environment issue. So we wanted to leave some time for questions, and you you had the last two questions. I don't know if you want to flash those back up there for the rest of the group, but I, I just think that might be a good way, if any, or if you have any other questions that people have, just open it up. Anybody have comments, questions? Go ahead. I just had a comment, actually. I thought, not in reference to these questions, but one thing that I found really fascinating was your one of your earlier conclusions that there may be a social a gap in the social and emotional opportunities and opportunities for democratic and civic participation between low SES and high SES schools. So
public and private in your country. And you know, I'm sure you've heard of it, but there's a phenomenon in our country that's emerging called the discipline gap. Mm -hmm. And it's um, this emerging research from Russell Skiba and Pedro Nogueira about um, differential rates of expulsion and suspension and other types of corporal punishment and very punitive punishments towards students. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing also a gap among racial, different racial groups in our schools. So I just think it's, that was a really fascinating aspect of the presentation. I'm wondering if there's some sort of school climate gap in our country and different school systems. So it got me thinking. Yeah. It's very interesting. Or it, it's, it's in, a, in a different level, is there some kind of country gap in terms of school climate as well? So perhaps if we did this in the US and in Israel, we could find that there's not only a, an achievement gap, there's also a school climate gap. Question is, I asked the, the, the girl from PISA in the AERK conference, that's why I had to leave your, your presentation. It's not just the girl for me. She's the head of assessment for all of PISA for all the countries, right? Okay. I think a girl for PISA and she's walking around with PISA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this is the head of assessment for all the countries in the world on mathematics and academic. And a bit tilted, but yeah, still. that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, there were, there's two questions here, yeah. Oh, wait, can, can I, I yeah, just finish that? And what she said was, do you think um, that she, they've been deliberating on this, I think some, and what uh, she gave back to me as feedback is, um, but do you think that it's uh, possible to use one index to compare uh, uh, to compare schools to put compare countries with? Can we use the same uh, index for compare, like SESE is an index that compares all countries. Can we come up with a, a, an index like we try, we're trying to do, that can really be used and applied to different uh, to different countries to see if we have a school climate gap. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's go with yeah. Do you have a question? Um, so when I when we brought our students to Chile this summer, we first went to Santiago, mm -hmm. and we visited a school that um, I don't remember what it was called specifically. I apologize, but it was like an agricultural type of school. So the students, it was in the outskirts of Santiago. And the students um, came from low SES backgrounds, and they were often from um, homes where the parents were incarcerated, or they had themselves been involved in school violence. And um, anyway, it was um, it was really really fascinating because these these students have been transformed by this school, and the the you know the climate is very positive and it's very empowering. And it was one of our you know our favorite visits when we were in Santiago, and I think that. I was just thinking that you know you're you're talking about how you want or you want the, the teachers to be involved in a more democratic way in decision making and it's I think a lot of you know work and it's time intensive but I think it really makes a difference to have them also be part of co uh, contributing to the research. So for example, like bringing those bring, maybe bringing some selected teachers and principals and doing their own little delegation visit like to this school and having them actually do some one-on-one -on -one interviews with students you know, over lunch or um, meeting with their founder and their teachers, kind of understand how pervasive the positive the school culture is. And I, I don't know, I mean, I think that it's, it's the, obviously very important that you have the actual um, quantitative data to support you and then point you in the right direction of where you need to focus, but I feel like in terms of practice, that's what really makes the difference for practitioners. They need to actually have their own um, direct experience, seeing how it can work, learning about, because again, it's all about people's stories. You know, everybody has a story, and everybody has the, had their own pain in their life, and it really kind of connects to, um, you know, they can like find, they can find connections, I think, personally and professionally, and bring, and then they can basically discern, okay, what could be uh, transferable back to like, their own environment, and then they're more on board, and they take ownership of it. Um, the experience that we've had with teacher uh, professional development, well, you were at our, remember the last thing we did was uh, to invite you to a, it was like a, uh, yeah, we had a group discussion with you. There, there was, there's a master's program as well for uh, uh, teachers wanting to become principals, and that's funded by the national, the, by the Ministry of Education. So the last part, remember there was a group of uh, 20 or something uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. That was a master's uh, program that we're doing. I, I collaborate with them. I'm not. I'm not. It's too much work. <laughs> but um, what I th what I see happens because they, they 
what what the the structure of that at least that master's program is to have two mentors which are like their school principals from schools who have been identified as good schools <coughs> and as the best schools and, and so I was in charge of the Maadula and school living together and the problem that we we had with one of the school's principals is that well we found that she had she was very authorita authoritarian she had a very authoritarian um, uh, school practices. Uh, but she had the best results. <laughs> There's so more than one way to get there. <laughs> so what do you do about it? So, so showing them the best practices. Now it's, yeah. uh, I, I agree with that theoretically. Yeah. And when you get down and try yeah. to do it, it, it has its bemoles. Uh, yes. <laughs> like when you play, yeah. it has this, when you play an instrument, the sharp. I really love the idea of doing the maps um, because I, I do research on school safety in New York City um, among middle school kids and what I'm finding is that um, there are differences in how safe kids feel um, between kids of different races even within the same classrooms um, and those differences vary um, based on where in the school you're asking them that they feel safe. So, for instance, black and Hispanic students feel less safe in the classroom than white and Asian kids, but that's not the same in the hallways. Um, and it's not the same outside school. The, the, the gaps flip in, in some cases, and they're really different. Um, so it makes me think that, you know, looking within schools and where within schools is really important, and you can't just say, you know, kids feel safe in this school. And that's too simplistic, at least in New York. Um, because there's a lot of variation among kids, and even based on where you're asking them, you know, where they feel. So I love the map idea that can really Could get you share that. perhaps your, the, your work with us? Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. sure. You know that in this room, there's the person who actually invented that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, at the ARA conference, which is interesting, once you put out the idea, apparently, like, people were coming up and saying that it's in projects all over using the original, I think it's 1999 ARJ piece that actually maps out. I think there's, cross-culturally it's interesting because what's nice about that instrument is that again the idea that you're not targeting individuals or groups necessarily but you're targeting space and time. So in terms of the transfer from place to place and area to area, I think there is more transfer because you're talking about a building in a space and that could be anything in every country and every culture you have spaces and areas that kids love to be, uh, kids hang out, that are dangerous and that they avoid. Those are usually the questions we ask. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was surprised by how many applications there were at ARA for reading and math and for violence and safety and for, so people are using the maps quite a bit. Uh, and because I think you avoid all the stigma of just, later you end up finding in the hot spots where they hang out the various different groups, but then you're not talking about those groups necessarily. It flips it, you're talking about, wow, hallways are really da 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 da, and lunch rooms are this way. So it gets us away a little bit of kind of this individual trajectory towards the poor kids or the African American kids. They're there, but you're talking more about school space. I don't know, and that makes it a little bit easier for people to talk about some of these climate issues. So I'm thrilled that you're using it here. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad that, that yeah, you I like it. For in New York, I think it's a lot about uh, surveillance, and right. so I think it's a lot about the police in the schools. And then, and and there's an empowerment piece. And who right. feels right. Safer, unsafe around the police that are in all of the schools. Right. Yeah. We can also, with this, in the school survey in New York, we can track kids over time, um, which has been really interesting to see how right. kids' feelings just as they change over time. You know, I just wanted to, uh, before it's over, just to, just to first of all, thank you uh, for the tremendous work that you guys are collectively doing and presented here. And I think it's just so impressive every time I see you present, uh, just because of the complexity and the potential that you have to hit the whole country. And I think you guys are so well positioned. But I, th I think there's a few things that, I, I mean, like the PISA question is a good question in terms of the climate piece mm -hmm. that I just like to throw out. And I think that there's a lot of theoretical, empirical, I mean, I know Chris is working on this too in here. Mm -hmm. We know there's differences between countries on certain issues, but I just want to throw out the theoretical idea that has to be answered empirically. Do we in any culture expect teachers, in other words, can I, you know, you've signed in that form that's an alien on, uh, today. If you were dropped in from Jupiter uh, on any classroom, let's just say maybe in Western kind of industrial societies, would you be able to get a sense in that classroom 
whether that teacher is actually engaging and working with it, even if you didn't understand the language, even if you didn't understand that. And my guess is that there's certain, uh, that most of us will probably, when you're going to, so you can get a sense that you're in a school, even though whether you understand the language or culture, whether things are working really well at that extreme, or if things are horribly wrong at that extreme. Maybe in the middle we don't know much about it. So I, I think the dimensions that we're talking about, feeling safe, da da da, have a subjective dimension, but What's surprising to me is a research question that we have to get then answer is, are we really talking about something that's unrecognizable? And because these questions are really about these larger, and I'm not sure we have to be able to test that between different cultures to see if these dimensions so. actually work or not. Perhaps but I'm not I'm not so sure that. I, threw it just out, I included PISA yesterday because I, I wanted. To but do that's normally talk. thrown out with a PISA person saying, "Well, how could we?" That's the underlying question. And I'm not so sure looking at the Taiwanese data, at these questions, at the Israel data, the questions, and now Chris's, and now yours. I, I don't know if these dimensions are all that off in terms of safety, teacher child relationships, peer relationships, risky peer. Well, I, they look awfully similar. One of the things that uh, I, I didn't show because of the time, but that we've discussed is how, uh, how odd participation as a dimension of school climate is. In all our, our we're all we all think that's strange, and we have to revisit that. Which somehow. means that we get really odd results, like in every we would country. Think participation is really associated with good things, and it's not. So. Yeah, and we're finding that over and over. So you know, it's interesting. You know, Taiwan has that, Israel has that, you guys found that, uh, California has that. You know, there's something going on there. So I think I think the answer to that person is possibly. But I wouldn't take it off the table just because we kind of say different cultures. Right. We're certainly doing that with math. Probably have time for one more question, and then we have. Oh, we're out of time. Are we out of time? Yes, we're out of time. Yes. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.